And also, I understand this spam folder stuff. It, I, I've been sending emails to my wife recently, and she commented that uh, I didn't send them. And then she found out, she looked in her spam folder, and all my emails to her were going to spam. And she said it was an accident, but I checked her settings last night. And it says all the emails from my husband go spam. But uh, you need to check. You never know what will end up in your spam folder. Now today and, and next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at some texts of scripture that are, I think, in some cases familiar to you. I have addressed these texts wherever I have pastored more than one time, over and over again. And, and yet I struggle at times thinking, are we really, really operating this way? And uh, the other thing I want you to remind yourself of when you study the scriptures, some people like to pit one scripture against another and say, well, you see, those contradict each other, or this is more important than that section, and, and that's less important. That's hardly what the scripture itself tells us. Paul wrote to St. Paul, and he said, all scripture is breathed by God, or God breathed. Now, whatever that means, it means that the voice and the, and the breath of God are on the scriptures. And God isn't stuttering when he speaks. And he doesn't give us one message somewhere else and then another message to trump that somewhere else. That would make the study of the scriptures more difficult even than we find it now. The scriptures are a tapestry that fit together beautifully. And we, we, we see them as a seamless garment. And what appears perhaps to be a contradiction to us is not so much a contradiction in the text, but in our understanding. And so we will be approaching this subject the next two weeks about how you deal with the sin in the church and uh, failure of the church, and I hope that we will be helped. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we live in a culture where uh, correction is not uh, invited nor often embraced, and even sometimes within the church. We ask today that as we study this section of, of the scriptures along with the passage next week, that uh, together we will see this important subject of recovery and correction and forgiveness in the church. Amen. I, uh, I love cartoons. And I know that some of you would understand that because it kind of reflects the depth of my research from week to week. I was in a, in a de desperate coma for some time after Gary Larson decided not to write any more of the far side. I, I gathered all of his collection together. I afforded them in my house. But the other, the other cartoon that I really liked was Peanuts and Charles Schultz and, and the, the messages that he would circulate in those cartoons. And one of my favorites from the Charlie Brown series has Charlie lying awake at night in bed. While tossing and turning and trying to get to sleep, he says, sometimes I lie awake at night thinking about all the dumb things I do every day. If I live to be 80 and I do 10 dumb things each day, that would be about 290,000 dumb things. And then a pause in his final comment. When you add up all the dumb things you do, it's best to use round numbers. <laughs> Bob Seger uh, doesn't do cartoons, nor does he write hymns. But he does send messages in the lyrics of his songs. That's especially the case in a song he wrote called Lock and Load. And in part, this is what Seger from Detroit has to say. Well, I wish I had a nickel for every time I fell and blamed somebody else. I'd give a ton of money to the ones I've heard, and I'd still be sitting pretty well. I spent years losing touch with what's right and what's real, caught up in these missions of my own. And you're telling me you think I've done so well while we're sitting here a thousand miles from home. There's a hole in your wisdom, a hole in your sky, two holes in your head where the light's supposed to get by. It's time to lock and load. Time to get control. Time to search my soul and start again. It's one thing for Charlie Brown to acknowledge doing thousands and thousands of dumb things. It's another thing for Bob Seeger to sing about messing up his life and falling and, and hurting people and having been hurt with his actions. In my life, 
and I am supposing in your life. One of the questions that I ask myself periodically is who is there who can sit down and talk to me about those kinds of things? Who can talk to me about the dumb things I keep on doing? Who can talk to me about the missteps that I might take? Who can look you and I and myself in the eye and say, you know, that wasn't very good. That was dumb. Or I, I think, you know, I think that was a poor choice and you may be hurting people with that. As you think through the, the journal of your life, who would you put in that position who is able to come to you with that kind of a conversation? I, I have said many times that I believe that if our relationships are not sufficiently developed to the place that others, not just any other, but others who really know us and who truly love us. And that's a short string, by the way. Even in a church like Christ Church, that each of us is going to have a very short string of people who really know us and really love us. But if our relationships are not sufficiently developed to the place where those kinds of others who see trouble in our lives can respond to that trouble by coming alongside of us and speaking to us about it, then we're really in bad shape relationally. Yet if the counsel of Jesus is taken seriously, then we who say we are followers of him are instructed to care enough to have enough love for others in our inner circle of influence that we will, in fact, go to them and carefully face those kinds of issues in their life. Now, that kind of relationship is not easy. It is, it is not a relationship that has no pain. But it is a relationship that is marked by honest love. Here's how two authors who I have great regard for expressed it. Listen. The delight of being close to someone is always accompanied by the peril of hurting or being hurt by that someone. Intimacy and the potential for pain go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. Yet a sociologist studying the average Christian church would see no essential difference in the quality of its human relationships and those of some local club, say a community service group or a country. Now, before we go any further, let, let me address a potential objection that some people would have to having a relationship, even a relationship of love, that's able at times, not always, but at times, to confront and correct. I hear from well-meaning, well-intentioned people when we approach this subject, well, that sounds like you're judging people. And didn't Jesus say that you're not supposed to judge people? Have you ever heard that? Of course you have. Well, in fact, Jesus did say that. These are his exact words from St. Matthew's Gospel, the 7th chapter. Judge not, and you will not be judged. But Jesus also said this, which was read to us earlier in Matthew chapter 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you came to brother. So which way is it? Which verse trumps the other verse? Well, the reality is no verse trumps the other verse. But the question is, how can I confront someone and, and not judge him or her in the process? By understanding the difference between correction in love and judgment. The word judge that Jesus used in St. Matthew's Gospel describes an ongoing condemning spirit. It describes a negative, caustic judgment that we fire off at people with really no intent to help them. Judging is a hasty and emotional response. And it's very often, 99% of the time, the wrong response. Judging in the scriptures is a verdict rendered by someone who really doesn't love it, without all of the facts, and it's based more on superficial gossip than anything else. And we who are guilty of judging 
are guilty of that when we reach hasty, premature conclusions about someone's heart and motive. But also, it tends to be a pattern in the way we relate to people generally. Confrontation or correction in the Bible is very different. Correction is a slow response. It's not a knee-jerk, shotgun approach. It can be emotional. Sometimes it's very difficult to confront someone, but it is controlled emotion. Also, confrontation or correction in the scripture has the distinct advantage of having gathered all of the facts, or as many as are available, before I reach a conclusion. Biblical confrontation deals in the arena of truth, not gossip. And it is for the purpose, the purpose of the confrontation is not condemnation and ruination, it is for, for forgiveness and restoration. I've never met a person with a judgmental spirit who operates that way as kind of a course of life. I've never met a person like that whose goal in their confrontation is to provide a way for forgiveness and restoration. What I have seen is an intense form of gossip and slander that is intended to ruin and condemn. That's the difference between the two. But in order for confrontation or correction to occur and to have any possibility of success, that is, forgiveness and restoration, you and I need to enter in to the process of uh, confronting or correcting those who are close to us. We need to enter into that with the appropriate attitude. And verse 12 of Matthew chapter 12 is placed where it is for that exact reason. Jesus is talking about the little ones, as he refers to, and he's talking using that as a term of endearment. <coughs> The term little ones describes anyone who's a Christ follower or a believer in Jesus. And, and Jesus sees us as little ones, almost childlike. And uh, he, is, he is commending them. But now look at what he says. What do you think, verse 12? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. In the land of Palestine, it was very easy, as you know, for sheep to wander and to stray away from the rest of the flock. Even young lambs that were still being weaned by, from the mother would wander away. Because as, as you've been taught before, I remember listening to Pastor Jeff preach on Psalm 23. If, if you listen to that, you know that sheep are stupid. Uh, I won't have you say that to one another, but basically you know that's true. And, and uh, in, the, in the early times, even sometimes now, there were very few restraining walls or fences around the pastures. And, and grass was scarce. That season. So wandering sheep were a common phenomenon. But first century shepherds weren't just good at paying attention to the flock as it was gathered. They were fantastic in tracking lost sheep down. They could follow the trail of a lost sheep for miles. And they did. Because every single sheep in the flock had value. Even the ones that stayed close versus the ones that went away. They had that. So Jesus is prefacing his remarks about correction with this story. To illustrate God's love, which is at the heart of every correction. God's love is a rescue mission, not a rejection mission. The shepherd tracks his wandering sheep down, not so that he can shoot it, and bring harm to it, or hang it up in front of the rest of the flock as an example of what you shouldn't do. He follows the sheep to rescue it. And the scriptures are telling us that God the Father cares for us like a shepherd cares for the sheep. And even if one of you is lost or is wandering, God the Father makes every single effort to track us down, to recover us, and then, as this parable says, to rejoice and to celebrate over your recovery. You see, that's, that's the difference between judging and 
correct them. When you judge someone, there's nothing to celebrate except your own masochistic sense of, uh, of pleasure. When you rescue someone and restore someone, there ought to be great joy and celebration occurring. Verse 14 of Matthew chapter 18 puts into neon lighting the heart of God. And that is, it's simply not acceptable to God to let one person go, to let one person slide, to let one person wander into sin without some attempt to bring that person back. Sometimes God does that on his own. Sometimes he uses you as his hands and his voice and his feet, and you become the instrument of drawing someone back from wandering and from outside of the fold. It may be years that they've wandered, but you are planted by God as a shepherd, and you became, become that instrument. We are part of the rescue project. But we are to come to the rescue project as shepherds with a heart of love and compassion and restoration. In fact, in, in verse 15, Jesus says that this whole deal about correcting and confronting, the, the whole purpose of that is, he says, to gain your brother or sister. The purpose of correcting someone is about their sin is to gain or win them back to God. The goal is to rescue them, not to reject them. And as we enter people's lives, we must never forget that purpose. And, 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 and enter we must into people's lives, assuming, of course, we have the correct person identified. Look again at what Jesus says in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 18. If your brother or sister sins against you, the person we are going to is a fellow Christian, a man or a woman, who are demonstrating a pattern of sin. You say, but the person has to have done something to me. It says sin against me. Well, before we use that as a rabbit trail to allow us out of the process, remember what we have taught you through this series on the church. The church of God is pictured as a body. We are pictured as a building with individual bricks cemented in and, and towards each other. We're pictured as a body where every part of that body is important. Ask Will Andre if an appendix is important. Every single part. So what happens to one part of the body happens to the other part of the body, the Church of Christ. And the fact of the matter is sin within the body of Christ, the Church, is really sin against every other person in the body of Jesus Christ. So, so we can't really say, well, it's not, it's not about me. If I'm a member of the body of Christ, if I'm a member of the temple, the building of God, it is about me. But let me also say this. Jesus is not talking about someone who just uh, momentarily, temporarily screws up, lapses into sin, but who just as quickly acknowledges that dumb thing that they did repents of that sin, and moves away from it. He's not talking about that kind of situation. If that were the case, then all of us would need to be corrected now, this morning. In fact, it would become a 24-7 occupation for some of us if that's what it meant, a temporary uh, mistake, a temporary lapse into sin. That's not what it's talking about. What Jesus is talking about is, is a case, a clear case of continual, serious, sinful behavior that a person is involved in that is beginning to take its toll on that person as well as other people in the life of another Christian in the church. Then God calls us to begin a search and rescue operation. That's why the first step of the actual encounter is the verb go in verse 15. Did you notice that? If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Jesus is making it clear to us that we as individuals have a responsibility in this area that is not open to multiple choice or take it or leave it approaches. But so often we read a verse of scripture like this and, and we sometimes say to ourselves, well, you know, um, I, I really don't want to get involved. I mean, it's really none of my business. Or, 
I, I'm sorry, I, I just think I, I know so and so, and this will just make it worse. I, I think we should just let sleeping dogs lie. Or, you know, sin, that's a tricky thing. I mean, who really knows what's right or wrong? And other times we'll simply say, you know, I just don't need this. I'm not very good at that kind of thing, and besides, my plate's full. I, I don't need this. I've said every one of those things, and a few more. And as good as those lines sound, and I can give you some even better sounding ones than those, they don't remove my responsibility or your responsibility. In fact, if, if, if we were honest, our problem in this verse is not with the word sin, it's with the word go. But the moment that I say, this isn't my deal, this isn't my issue, this isn't my problem, I have contributed to turning the church into just another religious club or country club. But you notice something else about this first step? Jesus doesn't tell me to gather up a posse and then go galloping after the person. He tells me that the first step is a one-on-one -on -one operation. It's a private meeting between you and the other person. Nobody else involved. Our responsibility is to go to the person, not to a committee, not to a church board, not to a small group, not to a group of elders or a council or a group of deacons, not to a Bible study group, not to any other kind of gathering that's part of the church, not even necessarily to a pastor or another close friend. To go to any or all of those kinds of people or groups first is to violate Jesus' instructions. Jesus wants to rescue the person. His intent is to maintain damage control. His method, one-on-one, -on -one, avoids the risk of gossip because it's just the two of you. You say, well, man, once I show up, what do I do then? Jesus says clearly, verse 15, tell him his fault. Now, I, I understand. Don't think that my head is in the soil somewhere. Don't think that, uh, that I have misjudged our culture. Don't believe that I'm living back in the 18th century. I am in the 21st century. I understand that little expression, tell him or her his fault, I, I understand. That's like dropping a toxic waste into the environment. How many people do you know are sitting at home waiting for you as a friend to come and tell him his fault? <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's set that time up. No, no, it's earlier the better. Breakfast is great. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I'm looking forward to it. In fact, I can't wait. I, I'm just surprised you took so long. To... I understand our culture. The last thing a culture of narcissism desires is anybody telling him his or her fault. But what Jesus means here is with gentleness, with firmness, you go to that person and you say, uh, Dave, uh, here's what I see. And, and you lay the cards out on the table. I'm your friend. I love you. I've got your back. But this is what I've been seeing. And this is what I'm observing. And, and I think this is what you know, too. So you don't whitewash it. You don't sugarcoat it. You don't minimize it. Here's what you see. Here's what you know. As directly, but as kindly as you know how, you explain how concerned you are with the problem as you see it in this person's life. And you encourage them to stop and you ask them for their response. So the initial private one-on-one -on -one confrontation is simply an opportunity for you as a friend to put your cards on the table and allow your friend to respond. My good friend, Hat Robinson, who teaches men and women across the country how to preach, has this wonderful word about this moment. He says this, confrontation emerges as part of the responsibility that Christians in a church owe to one another. It is the duty of love. Yet often in the guise of love, we keep silent. 
One of the surest tests of friendship is whether or not we will tell a friend about his or her faults. As friends, however, we believe we love too much to interfere in the life of a fellow Christian. Yet, it may not be love that keeps us silent. It may be indifference or fear. We may draw back not because we care too much, but because we care too little. If we refuse to confront, we can make no moral difference in another person's life. Confrontation should, not, should neither be the first word in the relationship, nor the only word, nor the major word. Yet at times it is a necessary word. And by the grace of God and through the confrontation of those who care about us, we can be better than we are. Now then, having done that, having gone to this person and laid the issue out before them, the ball now shifts into their court. It's now their responsibility to respond and Jesus indicates in verse 15 that the right response, the only response that leads to rescue is that that person will listen. The New Living Translation says that the response is to listen and confess their sin. That's what Jesus desires to happen. The idea behind the verb to listen is to admit that I'm wrong and then to be reconciled to the person who has come to me in love to confront me. A friend of mine is, in his commentary on this text says, to listen includes hearing, accepting, repenting, and requesting forgiveness. Now in your experience, can you remember a confrontation like that having that kind of result? The fact of the matter is, the fact that we can rarely draw down from our memories in the church, examples of that is a tragedy of the church. One writer, after reading this verse, centuries after Matthew wrote it, commented, I wonder whether there is anyone in these times who accepts correction. Do we listen when confronted with prolonged personal sin in our lives? Now again, I want to emphasize that Jesus talks about sin. That's the other part of this we get wrong. We read sin to be things I don't like. Well, what you may not like in somebody's life may have nothing to do with sin, so back off. Don't turn your preference or your persuasion that has nothing to do with biblical behavior and turn that into sin. That's not what's required here. What is required is that we lay it out clearly and kindly for the benefit of the person to be able to respond to and hopefully listen and turn from it. So often my experience as a pastor has been that people become defensive. They become angry with you, the person who cared enough to come to them. And you instantly become their enemy. They instantly go from saying, you're one of my best friends to I can't stand the sight of you. Don't you ever talk to me again. We, we lash back at those who had the courage and the grace to come to us individually. They, they didn't go anywhere else. They didn't send out any emails. They didn't do this or that. They came to us and they said, Dave, here's what I see. Most people that I've been involved in in all kinds of churches and settings don't respond well to that. They call me a judge. They call me this, they call me that, they call you the same kinds of things. But how many of them respond as Jesus indicated? We listen and we confess our sins. You see, the, the beautiful part about that is Jesus says, if this person listens, you have gained your brother or sister. What a great phrase. As far as Christ is concerned, 
what he goes on to talk about, what he outlines as we'll just look at briefly in the next two steps of this process. Uh, if the person doesn't listen, none of that, though, he's saying has to happen. If, if on the one-on-one -on -one level, the person listens to you, responds to you, accepts what you said, then we all gain something positive in the process. And Christ is providing us with the winning prescription for relationships within the church and in our personal lives. And it's as if Jesus is saying, look, it, will, you just, will you just listen for once to this person? Don't see it as an attack. View it as a search and rescue operation. See the love in the eyes of the person who's come to rescue you. And notice then, Jesus says, if the person listens to you, you gain your brother, that is the end of the deal. It's over. There's nobody else that needs to be involved. You don't need to send copies of the minutes of the meeting to everyone who needs to know. Nobody needs to know. The matter stays between you and the other person, and it's a settled matter. And your relationship is strengthened as deep. And so Greg comes to me last night in Nigeria. And he says, Dave, and we have a great relationship. And, uh, and Greg says, here, you know, Dave, I just, I want to, I just, this is hard for me, but I want to just chat with you. Can we, can we sit down somewhere quietly? And so we, we go downstairs with the ball game on, and, and that's, we, we turn the game on, and we have a cup of coffee. Well, I'm trying to get you coffee. But, um, we have a cup of coffee, and we have that conversation. And I say, you know, Greg, I'm so glad you came to, and I'm sorry that I've been doing this in your life. We pray together, we're in relationship with each other, and guess who else in the church knows about that? Nobody. 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 But instead, here's what we do. Greg's got a problem with me. So before coming to me, he rallies his supporters, lobbies for his side, gets as much uh, in, in factual, emotional information as he can, then he comes usually after sending out a notice to everybody in his Facebook world, I'm going over to see Walls now, let's see how this works out. And then he comes and drum, dumps his, his big truckload on me, and I apologize, of course, then he's got to go back to his Facebook friends who are already loose with the goose. You, you get the picture. But isn't that true? Isn't that true in your life? I'm not, we're not dealing with theory here. This is what happens in churches. But, but Jesus says, if you gain your brother, it's done. Greg and I, we never have to speak about it again. Or sometime in the future, Greg gets up or I get up and he say, you know, to, to help you understand this, um, three months ago, I went to see Greg and, and I had this to say and Greg responded. And, and then you have a model of what is positive in relationships. But people don't listen to me. And Jesus knew that, verse 16. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. The person says, nuts to you, Greg. I don't know who you think you are. You've got some nerve coming into my life. You hypocrite. All you do is judge and criticize. I, I, can't, I can't even imagine. Forget it. I don't want to talk to you anymore. If that's how it happens. And so the person refuses to listen. And so Jesus says, well, take one or two trusted people with you and go back and try again. Don't just write them off. Don't give up quickly. Go back with one or two persons. And the, 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 the wisdom of, of this procedure is obvious, not to mention that it follows the instruction of the Torah, the Old Testament law. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15 says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge or a complaint be established. Wow! Moses wrote that down. That's, a, that's quite a few centuries before Jesus borrowed that and, and principalized it into this text. The two or three that you bring along are either eyewitnesses They've seen the same thing in Greg's life or my life that you have, and they're trusted counselors, trusted friends, 
Or, if they haven't been, there wasn't anyone else, they're coming along to be eyewitnesses to the process that you're going through with that person so that you don't mess it up or, or overstate it or, or violently abuse that person. And, and so Jesus says, listen, okay, don't give up. The first time they write you off, they say some nasty things, don't take it personally. Get two or three to come with you now. Who, who can back up your story or at the very least back up what happens in the next meeting. So that truth of that meeting is not spun out of control by the confronted person and turned into exaggeration and lies. Oh yeah, and they sent a whole bunch of people to my place. Every single one of them loaded with bear, they already made up their mind. You can't believe what they said. Mm. No. The two are there not to add anything, not even necessarily to say anything, but to verify. How, how it was handled. By the way, this is a pretty good test to determine the truth teller from the non-truth teller. Liars always have to talk about the incident over and over and over and over and over again. They have to talk about it to as many people as possible over and over and over again in order to get their version out there into the public so that invariably their untruth gets spread around and becomes true. The truthful person rarely, if ever, speaks about the situation. Now, Jesus says, if that person, when two or three come with you, if they saw him, they acknowledge what they've done, they listen, they repent, and they move forward, that's exactly like the first step, now the matter's ended with as few as three or four people involved. So uh, Mike and Dave and, and, uh, and John and I went to see Greg. And the first time, you know, Greg kicked my teeth back down my throat. And I, I uh, was pretty ticked off for a while, but I said, okay, we're gonna try again. And we went this time and for whatever reason, Greg's approach was different and he saw the two other people who were with me or the three and he knew them and he trusted them and, and he, came, he caved in in the right sense. And at, we prayed together, everything's correct and restored and it's that tight little circle that doesn't go anywhere else. That's exactly what Jesus is, is, is wanting to happen. Now, sometimes that person listens and sometimes that person doesn't listen. Verse 17, Jesus says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, see, this is about the church. Let him be to you as a Gentile tax collector. The, the, the words, uh, the expression refuses to listen in verse 17 is stronger than the words does not listen in verse 16. This is ramped up again. This time the word refuse to listen speak. Uh, more, it speaks to more than a lack of a positive response. The language means the person pays absolutely no attention to your wisdom, your counsel, and your words. Zero attention. They don't even try to fake it. They have no inclination the moment you walk in the door to listen to anything you say. There's no sign of sorrow, there's no sign of humility, there's no sign of repentance, there's no acknowledgement that they've done anything wrong, and you are, in fact, the ones who've done the wrong. And Jesus says that's then when the church gets involved, the leadership of the church. That's what he says, I didn't make this up. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And, and then look what Jesus says. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, People who do not want to be corrected have no authorities in their life, not even the church. And you can spot that. All of us are raised to live in a, in a context of culture of some sense of authority over us. When we don't have that, we call it anarchy. And uh, I might not like the authority, but I still stop at red lights. I may not like the authority, but I, 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 I abide by the, the township rules and I pay my taxes. We all are in a position of authority in relationships and in our country and in our culture. And the church, Jesus is saying, 
is a level of authority in my life. And, and, and Jesus paints his words to say, I can't believe it. But it's possible that there are some people, they won't even listen to the church. And when they get to that point, that's when the process of recovery stops. Jesus says, all right, we've gone one to one. We took two or three others with us. We, we, we tried that. that, that then they, they wouldn't listen. And so we, uh, you know, we, we went the appropriate way to leadership to church. And, and we tried to get them to respond that way, and they still wouldn't. And now all we can do is just let them go. Pray for them, but there's nothing else we can do. We let them go. But it never, ever, ever has to go to let them go. It can all stop at one on one. If we're willing to listen to people who love us and know us and trust us and who have our hearts in their hand. And that's the way that God designed the correcting and the forgiving church.